Thank you all for joining us today and welcome to the 2019 Small Farms uh, Winter Webinar Series hosted by University of Illinois Extension Local Food System and Small Farms Team. We appreciate you joining us for these webinars. We will do our best to begin and end within the space of your lunch hour. This is a pretty tight time frame for educators to deliver in depth um, actionable information. So please understand why we are limiting your questions to the text box at the left during the presentation. I will do my best uh, to make sure our presenters answer them as time allows. And this week's pres this presentation will be recorded and Zach will email a link to the archive presentations as soon as possible after this concludes. There will also be a good link for a very short online evaluation of this presentation. And we appreciate your feedback on this. So this week's presentation is from Dave Shiley. He is a fellow local food small farms educator uh, that I work with housed in, in the counties of Coles, Cumberland, Douglas, Moultrie, and Shelby counties. In his role as an extension educator on our team, he identifies strategies for educating the public about issues in local food systems and resource management on a small acreage system. Additionally, he works with local foods producers and clients considering alternative income production opportunities on small acreage and woodlands. Dave also serves as the state coordinator for the Master Naturals program. Dave began his career with the University of Illinois Extension in 1982 as the camp manager and program director at 4-H Memorial Camp near Monticello. From 1992 to 2011, he served as a natural resources management extension educator at the Champaign Extension Center, providing natural resource management, programming, and support for 21 counties in East Central Illinois. And with that, we'll let you take it away, Dave. Okay, thank you. All right, so today we're going to talk about reducing damage from wildlife to livestock and specialty crops. When you look at nuisance wildlife, we can define that in lots of different ways, um, either a threat to our, our health or safety or impacting us economically. And that's probably the case and why you were tuned in today because we're looking at that economic loss. So we approach wildlife nuisance management uh, kind of from the perspective of integrating multiple approaches to reducing the damage. So this is a list of those options that you're going to see in a lot of the wildlife nuisance management um, research and information, uh, population reduction, removing that animal, or we'll talk a little more about that, habitat modification, so making it less uh, acceptable and uh, for either a predator in case of a predation on livestock or uh, one of those herbivores getting into your crop field, excluding them. we we'll talk about fencing options for some of these animals. Um, repellents, are any repellents available? So those might be incorporated. And, and then frightening devices like sound producing devices. So the important thing to remember is that there is not one silver bullet, so to speak, related to wildlife nuisance control. And wildlife, uh, for the most part, have learned behavior that if they don't eat, provide, uh, or find suitable habitat, then um, they cease to exist. They either die or have to uh, move, if possible, uh, to another more suitable habitat. So uh, they're gonna be pretty persistent and adaptable uh, and so we're we're going to talk about a couple animals that are extremely adaptable here in Illinois and, and really across the United States. So uh, population reduction. So we have an animal that's causing damage, immediate damage. And so your reaction then is to get rid of that animal as quickly, quickly as you can. Um, the important thing to remember here is that just because the animal is on your property uh, does not allow you to do whatever you would like to do to that animal. It's They're protected by a couple of different uh, laws and regulations. One is in Illinois, it's the Illinois uh, Wildlife Code. And other states have similar wildlife protection codes. Um, and so those wildlife codes basically list all the species that we have in Illinois, in our case, um, as protected and making it illegal for you to uh, harvest or remove that animal, um, harass it, destroy its den or nest um, without 
the, the correct permitting. So the, in Illinois, it's the Illinois Department of Natural Resources. And so we have district wildlife biologists throughout the state and uh, that have responsibility for your particular county. I'll talk about a resource to find that person if you don't know who that is currently. And th they would issue you a permit after discussing your situation. Um, it's a nuisance uh, damage permit. It's free of charge. It would give you instructions on uh, how uh, to go about uh, removing that animal, what to do with it after you caught it in a live catch trap, as an example. And um, uh, and then there's a report that you'd fill, fill out. If we're dealing with a migratory bird, then they're protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Um, in the early 1900s, we had this act in, uh, that is managed or enforced by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So. So again, just to, to reduce your risk as a landowner operator, make sure you follow the, the correct procedures when dealing with wildlife, even though um, it may be something that you're really, that, that um, you're, you're ready to do something immediately about. So popula population reduction in terms of trapping, uh, live trapping is uh, an appropriate strategy when we have a problem animal. So an animal that is either targeting your livestock um, or it might be one that is moved inside a building so a raccoon as an example this time of year the those species raccoons possums um, trying to find a, a suitable artificial den site um, uh, and that and they so they choose your building uh, or your home and move indoors so that's an animal that is going to be tough to get rid of by just catching it outside or seeing it leave and boarding up that opening so that's a candidate for population reduction of one animal just keep in mind that when we do this it, um, your permit's going to tell you what you can do or you can't do with that animal once you get it in your trap and it's in your possession um, and that is releasing it uh, um, on your own property um, or on private property with the permission of the landowner so you can't release it on public property. A lot of people would like to take it to a public park um, and send it off on a um, on its way. Uh, there, uh, it's, and there's the, the other problem from a biological standpoint is that that animal then is competing for with other animals of the same species for food, water, shelter, and that habitat already has. Um, a, what's termed a carrying capacity that uh, based on food, water, and shelter. And so it's going to be competing. A lot of times they uh, will starve or they'll get into uh, a fight with an existing animal, a territorial fight. Those animals will defend their territory based on, um, you know, that survive, need for survival. And when you release that, or you catch that one animal, then, you open up carrying capacities to support another animal and so therefore it's termed a short-term fix and um, we can hire someone if you don't want to in illinois we have uh, wildlife licensed wildlife nuisance trappers and it is, it's expensive that note about being very expensive for example if you had raccoons that uh, a female with four young that were ended up getting inside a building in the middle of summer, then typically these nuisance wildlife trappers uh, will charge per animal. So it can be, you know, 75 to hundred dollars per animal, depending on where you are in the state and Northern part of the state, a little bit more than that. And so four or five, $600 later, um, you're dealing with removing that animal from a building. So population reduction is better looked at as, um, uh, as a management goal, reducing the total population through things like recreational hunting, seasonal trapping. If you don't do that yourself, then inviting someone that does do that onto your property, if it's in an area that um, is outside of uh, city limits where those kind of activities can occur. So reducing the population overall population of that particular animal is then going to reduce the number of animals that are trying to get to your livestock or or crop and 
increase the ability of other strategies to work more effectively. Remember that integ integrated approach. So let's talk for a minute about raccoons. So raccoons, um, extremely adaptable. We have wildlife, and in this case, mammals that have our habitat generalists and habitat specialists. So a habitat generalist, this is a great example, it can, whether we find it in its natural habitat of um, a forested area, uh, next to or adjacent to um, uh, a water course or living right in a large city. So they're, they're very comfortable, very get used to people very quickly, learn that we have food sources that they can ut utilize. So raccoons can be problematic. They don't, they, they're not uncomfortable living in and around people. Because they're a very strong animal and they have, toes that are very finger-like, they can uh, expand small holes in buildings to gain access. You see some pictures here where uh, through the roof of a building and then through the soffit where they've enlarged that hole. Raccoons need an opening about four, four inches in diameter to get to gain access. So even though they look much bigger than that, most animals, if they can get their head through an opening, then their body will follow. So that's the kind of, uh, um, so doing an assessment around your building, looking for small holes that if there are raccoons on your property, then they might be inclined to enlarge those. And we're definitely in that uh, season now uh, here in March that, uh, that, that uh, raccoons, sows, females are looking for a place to den up. So make sure that you um, scout for those areas and make those necessary repairs. If you're raising poultry, then um, the, the kind of looking to see what kind of damage. Oftentimes we find dead animals, dead uh, chickens in this case, or, or ducks. Um, and so raccoons, uh, in, in terms of damage they cause, they'll take several uh, birds in one night. Uh, and then they'll do partial feeding on that animal. So they typically start at the crop, the breast, and then at the entrails. So um, it's, that's kind of one way to identify the damage. The U.S. Department of Agriculture um, has a division called the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, or APHIS is the acronym. They have a Wildlife Services Division, and they've got some great information um, on how to identify that damage, you know, kind of that CSI damage report, you know, what is, what's really causing my damage? Because we're not often seeing that animal um, if the eggs are missing. So raccoons are, um, their, their characteristic in terms of egg damage is that they're going to carry them away from the nest. They're not going to eat them in the nest like a possum might. Um, and so uh, typically, maybe up to 28 feet, 30 feet away from that nest area, maybe the other side of the coop or outside the coop, um, but away from the nest. Occasionally you see raccoons targeting lambs. So, uh, and the damage they're typically causing are chewing on the face uh, of that, of that lamb. And management strategies, you see that frightening is not effective. And again, trapping of that one particular problem animal um, yeah, is a strategy you might uh, adopt. Make sure that you're looking at underneath this building in this case, uh, the best thing to do would be to permanently um, make modify that building. So that space is closed. In addition to raccoons, you might have skunks that are gaining access as a den site underneath that well-protected uh, location for a den. Um, so the landowner here didn't uh, uh, saw an, an immediate need and, and so use electric fencing. So that's a possibility too as a temporary fix. But long term, make sure that those kind of areas are you exclude them from getting into those to begin with. Uh, make sure you're not leading, leaving food sources out. If you have an, um, domestic animals, cats, dogs outside, make sure you bring in that food at night. Raccoons, of course, are nocturnal. Um, 
and uh, and then make sure that uh, if you've got a if you've got a chicken coop that you're closing all those doors, the windows prior to sunset, so you're limiting or minimizing the in, the entrance of that raccoon through a an easy easy opening like a door or a window. From crop fields, electric fencing is uh, a really good option. Again, not in an urban area, but electric fencing, though, if you put one wire six inches off the ground um, and then a, 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 to ensure success, add a second wire six inches above that first one. Um, make sure you could you, to have those charged up at night. So the fence charger can be easily be put on a timer to turn on uh, at dusk and off at sunrise. Um, and then anticipating the damage. You always want to, you know, we know that uh, raccoons as an example in terms of crop damage are going to consume or be attracted to sweet corn right before maybe a week or so before that is ready to harvest. So the fence, you need to anticipate that damage, get your fence installed prior to that. Anytime we're trying to interrupt a, a, a behavior of an animal, whether it's a raccoon or something else, it's just more difficult because they're accustomed to, they're going to work harder to get around or through uh, that obstacle to get to that food source they know is there from an, a previous visit. Uh, they can cause damage to melons. Um, and the, the damage we see in melons um, is they're going to chew a hole and then use their hand, their paw, to scoop that melon out. So if you find some melons with holes chewed in them and uh, in, the inside of that is scooped out, then probably dealing with raccoons. And again, electric fencing is um, an option there. Since there aren't any repellents and they're not and frightening devices, um, like sound, loud sound producing devices like a propane cannon, the, they're going to get used to that. So uh, they are just not turn their short term effectiveness. So fencing is really the best option. OK, and then skunks, so striped skunks, the, um, both raccoons and skunks, uh, uh, adults teach their young how to find food in the late summer, early fall. So you may see an increase in damage. Um, or a number of animals on your property that weren't there earlier as they they roam around. Both raccoons and skunks do have large home range home ranges. So, for an example, going back to the raccoon, um, a male raccoon will travel in a rural area uh, about five miles. So, uh, within its home range. Uh, to find food, water, and shelter. So they, they do travel around beyond your, your just your farm. Um, with skunks, if we're gonna look at removing that animal, the best thing to do is probably hire a professional. The skunks can be trapped using a covered trap. Um, it's gonna reduce the, the potential for spraying. Doesn't eliminate it, um, no guarantees, but when and skunks are trapped, uh, they typically are going to use a live catch trap that has a plastic cover over that uh, to keep that skunk calm until it can be taken away and, um, and euthanized. So both skunks and raccoons, if you've got a permit to do this on your own, then in Illinois, they're going to require, your permit's going to require you to euthanize this animal or release it on your own property. So if you remember that large home range, so if you caught it up, caught the animal uh, out of a building and you own a hundred, a hundred acres, let's say, then um, the, um, uh, it's just not big enough area. You'd need to move it miles away. So uh, raccoons, the number one carrier of rabies on the East coast, uh, not necessarily in Illinois. And so that's one another reason moving both skunks and raccoons from one place to another is not um, a, an allowable thing uh, here in Illinois. So management uh, uh, for skunks, um, we want to remove things that might be attracting those animals up to uh, near your poultry house. So skunks can 
uh, consume eggs. They also are going to take young animals. Typically, don't see them taking adult uh, birds out of your out of your coop, but uh, they will go after uh, chicks and and consume eggs. So, um, around uh, your farmstead, around that that chicken coop area, removing brush piles. Brush piles are going to be attractive to rodent populations. So, um, and adi additionally, controlling rodent populations around buildings is a recommended practice. They do eat in a lot of insects. So sometimes we see in large turf areas, especially as they move into urban areas, uh, they can do some turf damage looking for grubs. So, um, you know, uh, scout your those turf areas for grubs and control as as needed. If you're looking at more than 10 grubs in a square foot area, then um, you may consider an insecticide application. But um, and then they're going to be attracted like raccoons to pet pet food outside. So make sure you bring that in. Um, and that that opening underneath that foundation is another location, a good place that uh, we have a lot of outbuildings oftentimes that have that space. So closing that up either uh, with with uh, lumber or wire. If you're going to use wire, um, then you may uh, need to go ahead and bury that. And even with if it's if it's wood tight to the ground, then we're going to con be concerned about um, uh, damage to that wooden structure. So, um, but skunks will dig uh, underneath a underneath a building uh, or underneath the fence. So oftentimes, if we're trying to exclude a, a skunk from a building, we're going to want to bury wire. Uh, attach it to the bottom of that foundation, like in that, that previous slide we saw with the electric fence, would attach wire to the bottom of that uh, wood uh, floor joist and then bury it uh, down uh, six to 12 inches. Uh, if you can go 12 inches, it's a, it, it's a little bit better, but at least six inches deep. And so there's uh, uh, some recommendations on skunk odor removal. Um, this is a recipe that you see that was developed by Dr. Hoffman. Is uh, um, a number of years ago. You'll see that floating around. It's recommended on the uh, with our Living with Wildlife website um, on nuisance wildlife management practices. Make sure that you do not mix this ahead of time. You think, well, this is, I'm going to keep some on hand and put it in a closed container because it's producing oxygen and, um, and can explode. So just mix up what you need in an open container. Um, don't store it or try to attempt to store this mixture um, as it continues to produce a gas and, and may rupture that container. Red fox, we have um, red fox kind of modifying their behavior in Illinois and kind of throughout the Midwest. We see red fox moving into urban areas um, and uh, being and sometimes being outcompeted uh, by coyotes uh, for the same food source, eat a lot of rodents. Um, but so the fox are can um, target young goats, sheep and piglets, um, fox, keep in mind that fox are about 10 or 12 pounds. So they're a, kind of a small animal, even though they're long legged. So they don't typically attack um, adults. There's always that exception when we th think about um, when I say, or anyone says, well, they don't do that. <laughs> There's always that um, unusual behavior by a particular uh, animal species, but typically we see the damage from red fox uh, on young animals. Poultry are probably more uh, aptly targeted because it's a, a, a prey item that is smaller. So uh, electric fencing on top of poultry pens, they can climb over a fence just like a coyote. So outside uh, the perimeter at the ground level, um, You'll see a picture of a fence here in a minute with a trip wire. The trip wire is an electrified wire that's about eight inches away from the base of the fence, about six inches up off the ground. So they hit that 
um, in addition to the uh, electric fencing. So if they make it past the trip wire, then electric fence on top of the poultry pen uh, as they're climbing up and over um, is uh, that additional uh, practice that you may want to try to do to, to, if you're having problems with red fox. Um, you can protect young uh, sheep uh, and, and goats by doing shed, uh, lambing and farrowing uh, and kidding. So uh, as a way to protect them, good practice if you've got coyotes too. Um, you wanna make sure you're monitoring free range poultry. So uh, sometimes, especially in the spring when, when uh, red fox and then next animal we're gonna talk about coyotes have pups they're taken care of, then their need for food um, increases and we see them adjusting there if they're normally nocturnal or in the case of a fox crepuscular crepuscular just means that they're active right at dawn and dusk so they may get a little more active later in the afternoon uh, to extend their hunting activity because of the need for more calories to feed those pups um, if they do take a uh, a, a chicken or a duck and typically they do it one at a time and they'll carry that animal off to its den site and so you'll see uh, oftentimes the outside of a den um, of, if it's a fox uh, with uh, partial partial uh, carcasses there uh, bones feathers um, and and that sort of thing from that uh, habit of hauling that animal off. Uh, and again, um, reducing the population, overall population. So if you're really having problems with red fox, then um, again, that integrating that additional practice of, of reducing the population through hunting or trapping during the trapping and hunting season. And just as a reminder in Illinois, we have the season for these uh, fur-bearing animals, which rac red fox, raccoon, skunk would be in that category, and you need a hunting license that, um, and a trapping license in Illinois, and most states are going to require that as well. So let's talk about coyotes for a minute. So coyotes, this is a nationwide, this is the most common and serious predator we have in terms of livestock damage. So coyotes are going to kill typically by attacking the neck of that animal, try to crush its trachea. Um, so that's where the damage is concentrated on. Uh, they're uh, able to climb, they're good at digging. Um, if they get in and get one animal and target your pasture, your uh, flock, then they're gonna be even more persistent about getting under or over that obstacle. Um, Again, like fox or like uh, raccoons and skunks, uh, the pups are taught how to hunt by the parents. So we have uh, in the fall, you might see um, a pack uh, of coyotes that are, that's a family group. Um, and again, if you're trying to, de to determine the damage, what's, you know, you've noticed a, a dead, um, uh, one, of your, one of your lambs is dead. Um, and obviously been killed by a predator, then um, if the, the coyote, if the damage is on the neck, then it's coyote. If the dog, if you've got some neighborhood dogs or that are uh, the culprit, then dogs are gonna, you're gonna see the damage by uh, uh, on their legs, their hindquarters, oftentimes the ears, um, and, they're, and they're just gonna kill that animal and consume very little of it compared to a coyote. Coyote damage reduction uh, techniques include uh, some type of predator fencing. So, um, and that's fencing that's either electrified um, or has what's called a coyote roller on top of that uh, fence. And a coyote roller uh, is um, just simply a pipe uh, there are there's commercial versions that you can install on top of a fence more suitable probably for smaller paddocks uh, and backyards than uh, out in a in a pasture setting but um, moving the livestock um, into an interior paddock so a lot of times 
you kind of you can kind of think of that as a, a double defense. So you're moving them into um, interior paddock at night. Uh, it's either closer to human activity, um, but um, more importantly, has more security on it. So it's electrified with a trip wire on the outside, electrified on the top, maybe with some additional outriggers or and or a coyote roller, which is a pipe that is attached in between post the rolls as they try to, if they climb that fence they, and they'll uh, not be successful at getting over that. And we'll talk about that in, this, in a little bit more in just a second. Um, again, shed, uh, moving the animals in to do shed lambing, calving, or kidding is a really good practice. It's going to uh, also make it more uh, suitable environment for those young animals uh, in terms of the weather. Uh, coyotes are attracted to dead livestock. So um, a number of years ago, I had some phone calls from some folks living out in the country that the, they were coming home and they the coyotes were in their yard and not running away. So they kind of lost a little bit of their fear of humans and I'd uh, never heard of that before. So I did some checking with our wildlife biologist locally and he asked if there was a livestock uh, facility nearby. Um, and I said, well, yeah, there is one across the road from this uh, homeowner. And so he said that in he had a couple of calls, and this has been probably 10 years ago at this point now, that um, those uh, coyotes had associated humans with the food availability, in this case, a dead animal. So uh, he also had some situations where people were intentionally feeding coyotes, again, associating humans with food. And so all bad things in terms of trying to deal with an, an animal that can potentially cause damage to livestock and also domestic um, uh, animals we may have as pets. Um, poultry need to be locked up just like we I mentioned with the other animals. Um, make sure those are put in at night. Again, keep in mind that that night fall uh, might be extended a little bit into late afternoon as we get into during that high need for food when they're raising those pups in the spring. Um, and then population reduction is a strategy also. Sometimes they'll have individuals that are targeting in a particular area. Uh, it's, it's part of a strategy. It's not a strategy that is going to be effective alone, but can be used to help in your multiple strategy, your integrated pest management strategy, strategy, if you will. And then guard animals. We'll talk about guard animals here in just a second. Can be also utilized to help uh, protect livestock. So let's talk first about, about bobcats. So bobcats are thought to normally to uh, only occasionally attack young sheep and goats. I know down in uh, down by Mount, Mount Vernon, a large male uh, bobcat here. Um, this in the past uh, six months or so was targeting uh, adult animals uh, because of its size. But typically we see them uh, attacking young sheep or goats or uh, poultry. So this is an animal probably if you have free range chickens um, and, a, and a domestic cat along with coyotes made take your domestic cat uh, would be one to consider. Uh, our bobcat population in Illinois has gone from being on a threat, a threatened species to one that we now have a, a hunting season. So seasonal hunting might be one, but managing your herd uh, or your flock uh, is probably one of the best strategies for dealing with bobcat. Hawks and owls, again, this is a migratory bird. So we have not only state regulated uh, regulations we have to follow, we have federal laws. So occasionally hawks and owls are gonna prey on poultry. Hawks typically during the day, owls in the evening. Uh, it's the larger hawk, red tail in this picture, sometimes Cooper's hawks. Cooper's hawk is one that if you have a forest, if you're home or your your uh, farmstead is in a forested area we're going to see cooper's hawks both of those will take poultry um, 
And then, and again, targeting. So uh, you don't want to be tempted to uh, uh, do physical harm to one of these types of birds because they're protected by uh, those federal laws as well. So again, consulting, um, minimizing uh, the the uh, time of day when these animals might uh, come in contact with them, a little harder with hawks, but certainly with owls, getting those chickens in a little bit sooner. My son-in-law had uh, owls, uh, an owl, a barred owl, taking out uh, some poultry out of a backyard coop uh, out in the country uh, uh, last spring. And so he had some young birds, they were about half grown. Uh, they were put, letting them out during the day and then a little bit slow getting them in at night. They were they were just learning how to get in and out of the coop. And so as soon as it targeted one, it came back night, every night uh, after that, either uh, taking another bird or um, sitting on a fence on a telephone pole watching to see if the one was available. So learn to behavior again. So if you've had a problem interrupting that, in his case, he put a cover, uh, some shade cloth over that pen uh, to reduce the um, the damage. And the, co the comment I just see about the chickens running into the goats, so a lot of times those larger animals or a pasture uh, is, uh, is, a, is a great idea. So all right, let's talk briefly about domestic dogs. So your pet, your, your neighbor's pets, um, uh, two things, you know, one, protecting your pet from predation. Uh, again, doing all those practices that are going to reduce the attraction to your home. Uh, don't, you know, removing the pet food, controlling your pets, especially at night. If, you're, if you have a, a, a dog that stays in a pen, as an example, at night, make sure that uh, that pen is secure. That, remember, coyotes are going to go up and over a fence. So make sure that you've got that well protected so there's, that uh, they will attack large dogs because they see them as a competitor and they'll kill and eat uh, or carry off younger dogs, small dogs rather, small breeds. Um, there's been an increasing... Um, uh, situation where we see more and more coyote attacks of on dogs uh, in urban areas. Um, even with people taking them on a leash through um, uh, a park area. So again, keeping an eye open for sometimes coyotes will trail you, um, trail their, their uh, uh, prey item for a while. Uh, so just um, when you're out with your own pet as an aside in a park area and you know there's a lot of coyotes uh, in an area that we can't do any kind of we're not doing any kind of removal then just keep an eye out for that now, dogs can also be predators so uh, again once sometimes they do it to play uh, take it a step further um, typically these attacks occur during the day you need to have have talked to um, livestock owners that are pretty upset about that and are ready to um, uh, do some something not so great to that dog um, of their neighbors. And I you know, strongly discourage that. So um, you need to talk to them, let them know what's going on. There is a animal control officer in your county that should be able to also help with that. Um, but I, back when I was had poultry on my folks farm growing up, I had dogs uh, get, op get a door open. I didn't have a great latch on the door and they killed about 25 birds in one night. There were three dogs and they had um, um, kind of that mob behavior, I guess. Uh, They're great dogs during the day, but um, went a little bit crazy at night. <clears throat> All right, so we want to proactively protect livestock. So we're going to, we talked about confinement a little bit already. We're going to talk about that more, excluding them, and then use of guard animals. So sheep and, sheep and goats, confinement. So shed, lambing, and kidding is a, uh, uh, as an alternative to pasturing. It may not be in your system currently, but it's a great, um, it's a practice that if you have a, lot, have a high coyote population, 
or you've got fox nearby, then that may be something you want to adopt. Confining the flock at night. So that may not be practical depending on the size of your flock. But again, you're reducing that access. So um, anytime you can use an exclusion technique that is going to uh, at least limit or eliminate access by that predator, then uh, it's, a, it's a good practice to adopt. And then <clears throat> moving the flock into an interior paddock. So, um, and that interior paddock uh, fenced area needs to be more well protected in terms of electric electrified. So if you can't electrify your entire pasture fence, as an example, then moving, those, moving them in at night uh, into a fence that does have adequate protection. If you have uh, had historically had problems with um, predation from, from coyotes. If you can, um, you know, avoid those pastures with history, uh, the history of predation, but typically, you know, we, we can't do that. So uh, again, moving them into interior pastures. Uh, if there's pastures closer to buildings or human activity, that is going to uh, reduce, but not eliminate. So again, like I said, the, using the example of coyotes being uh, more aggressive uh, and less fearful of humans, if they get uh, the, their, uh, in my assessment, coyotes are kind of adapting to us a little bit more uh, and accepting us uh, as, as not a threat. So as they do that, then they get more comfortable coming in into and closer to our home. Uh, so using pastures closer to the buildings without any additional things like electrifying electrified fence that may not be uh, a practice you see as being successful. If there's a uh, shrubby vegetation surrounding the pasture, they're gonna, a predator is gonna use that to get closer access to your livestock. So removing that if possible. Um, and then uh, in cases where uh, there's a sheep producer uh, in Champaign County that their her pasture goes right up against uh, a forested area that uh, along the Salt Fork River. Uh, and so it's a travel corridor. So she has um, a situation where it's impossible to remove, remove that vegetation or even get much of a buffer there. So she's got to look at some other practices. Uh, and, and in her case, fencing and the use of guard dogs um, are a couple of strategies she has um, utilized. If you can, lights. Uh, again, I think lighting is a practice that animals, particularly mammals, are going to get used to that. But it's a, another strategy if it's used as part of a integrated approach, uh, it may have a place for that as well. And then again, keeping younger animals into in those interior pastures is a, a great um, practice to help re reduce the pr reduce predation. So. And our goal may not be, we may not be able to eliminate all of it, but certainly a reduction um, is really, um, a, a, a may be looked at it more as a practical goal. So in terms of fencing, electric fencing alone, you modify existing fences. If you've got a, a woven wire fence already up to in your pasture, then putting electric wires on top uh, and then outrigger uh, and then a trip wire. Uh, was going to help reduce the cost, make it a little more affordable. Uh, we have some uh, folks with that use um, uh, pasture management with using portable electric fences or net wire. It's electrified. Um, and then that coyote roller I was talking about, the fence. If you're going to use a coyote roller, typically our welded wire, woven wire fences aren't five and a half feet tall. So Coyotes will be able to jump right over it. As soon as they try to jump, they're going to grab the top of that fence to help them push on over. If that roller, that pipe is there and they can't get good grip, then they'll just get back further and jump clean over the fence if it's not at least five and a half feet tall. So don't spend the money on a coyote roller if you're not, if you don't have your fence at least that tall. These are some uh, defense diagrams. The internet, we have um, 
access to the Internet Center for Wildlife Damage Management. Um, it's recently become, um, it used to be uh, .org, you see there, it's now .com. It is, uh, though, still uh, housing all of our land-grant institution uh, research related to wildlife management. Um, and it's got some great fence diagrams. So if you're looking for more information, what are my alternatives, uh, then uh, I would want to point you to that um, to that fence uh, design. So this is a very extensive fence here. These, these are uh, spaced very closely at the bottom. You see four inches apart. Uh, eight inches uh, at the top every other you've got a charge wire and a ground wire alternating up and down that fence um, and it's six feet tall so we're looking at a fence that is the top wire being charged that's when they're going to try to grab a hold of but uh, and then an outside trip wire so uh, but that that is not a cheap design here's another design that's utilized that Fencing, existing fencing that put outriggers to with the electrified outriggers on that fence. You can, and um, you could add a trip wire to that as well. But uh, if you've got an existing pasture fence, this is a way to tighten it up a little bit uh, to reduce damage. Okay, I want to talk just a little bit about guardian animals. You see, you may have uh, looked at that. Some people are. Uh, use, utilizing those, um, and um, the options are dogs, llamas, and donkeys. So the we'll start out by saying the U.S. Department of Agriculture Animal Plant Health Inspection Service started some additional research on guard dogs uh, in 2014, and I was looking to see they, they don't have that published yet, but this is uh, some information from a study that was updated in two, 2006 out of Colorado State. Um, and the two, there are several species of dogs that are used uh, as guard dogs. These are the two species that uh, were reported to be better. Um, and so that's why it says that they're preferred. 84% um, of the people in that survey uh, indicated the dog's uh, performance at excellent to good. Um, they're going to deter a lot of different species of wildlife. The downside is that um, they are going to be ag maybe aggressive to other people uh, other than you uh, on your in and around that, uh, the, your livestock. Um, so depending on your situation, that could be a may not be a great thing. Uh, they don't live very long in terms of the actual time that they're going to be uh, guarding your your flock. So they've got to be started as young pups. Um, most of the information uh, related to guard dogs that uh, the USDA APHIS has on their wildlife services page talks about pups. Um, uh, are these dog, they're maturing at about a year, year and a half um, in terms of being able to protect. Sometimes the pups uh, uh, they have to be trained, so you sometimes they can be aggressive to the livestock, so that they're try, supposed to be protecting uh, as a pup until they learn to be that they're you know part of that flock. So um, it, it takes a, it takes some effort to get them um, trained, and then they have to be fed uh, every day. So um, there is some in that. Colorado information uh, report talks about spaying and neutering to increase attentiveness. Typically, you're looking at one animal, sometimes two. Um, uh, it seems to me that guard dogs, like I said, there's a, a small farm in Champaign County that's using them. Guard dogs are typically an option that uh, you see a lot more reporting of it being used in areas that we have home open range where fencing and other some other options aren't uh, as viable. So the dogs are more labor intensive to get uh, that animal to be serviceable. Llamas are another option. They, uh, they had, one of the advantages is they need less training. Uh, typically, we're looking at one animal. Um, unless there's a family group, but one animal um, is better. They can um, 
they're going to live longer, be a longer service time. They're still let survey, uh, re still rated them as being effective or very effective. Uh, so uh, a little bit less than dogs, but still pretty good. Um, intact males may cause a problem with trying to breed ewes. Uh, so um, need to consider that. And they may also attack your family pet. So if you have a dog that, that goes out in the pasture with you um, or wanders out that direction, then it may be a, become an issue. So just a thing to consider related to llamas. Donkeys are hard to find. They're, uh, they're the least expensive option, but uh, they're not as effective as either dogs or llamas. And you see that uh, only six, about 60% of the Texas sheep producers in a survey uh, rated donkeys as good or fair. So uh, females, if you're going to go the donkey route, then females are going to work better than males. Um, and uh, again, one animal rather than uh, a family group is they're going to then bond with the flock is uh, and both llamas and donkeys. Um, there's a question I want to quickly address on red on the red flashing lights. So there are there is some new uh, research being done with um, low intensity lasers uh, using um, used either in combination with a motion detector uh, on the fence perimeters. And so we'll see how that um, research comes out, but has some has some promise. Also sound producing devices that are triggered by motion detectors um, is another strategy that's being researched currently. So let's switch gears here a little bit now to finish up with some livestock, with some uh, crop damage from a couple animals. Birds are one of those. Blackbirds, sometimes people assume that they're not protected. Um, we have three bird species in, uh, in Illinois that aren't protected by state or federal law, and that's starling, European starlings, uh, English sparrows, are, uh, and uh, pigeons. So blackbirds are a migratory bird. So we don't want to do anything that uh, in terms of lethal control of blackbird populations because um, it was breaking federal law at that point. So propane cannons sometimes will cause damage to sunflower uh, production fields. So if anybody's growing uh, sunflowers um, for the seeds, uh, propane cannons, and then um, there's some uh, firecracker devices, the pyrotechnics that can be also be used to move the move the flock out of that field. Uh, starlings can transfer salmonella to livestock, so there are some designs that if you have uh, cattle feed feedlots that are having difficulty with starlings into the feed, then and water resources, then there's some good uh, information related to that um, through the USDA's. APHIS uh, Wildlife Services uh, website. If you've got crop damage from uh, bird feeding on small fruits, then netting is an, uh, is an option. Um, frightening techniques have been not very effective. They're uh, rated as short term with birds. So netting, again, you're excluding them. Uh, uh, you've got to use a row cover. Uh, with a frame so that the net is away from the fruit crop, got to be put on, put uh, in installed before the fruit starts to turn color. Um, so obviously, that being said, it's expensive, labor intensive, um, and it's and it becomes difficult for you to harvest that fruit as well. So, I visited a farm up in Minnesota a couple years ago, and they. Uh, had tried these row covers of netting um, and were getting frustrated with the harvesting. It was protecting the fruit, but it was difficult to harvest and they had to put it back down. They used um, both a uh, uh, frightening device, an owl uh, and a hawk, uh, plastic, and the birds figured those out very quickly. And then um, they used distress calls. They have recordings of birds under, under distress. And they used the, that, em, employed that as well without a lot of long-term effectiveness. Immediate, yes. Long-term, no. So they were going to cover their five acres in netting. 
um, over the top of their uh, small fruit production area. So very expensive, um, but they're in the middle of a forested area and and just uh, in a in a real bad situation in terms of high population of animals they're trying to manage. All right, and then rabbits. So just a brief comment about rabbits. You can see that multiple litters, uh, typically uh, rabbits are going to uh, be in those shrubby, brushy areas. They need a combination of grasses and forbs for, for, and will eat agricultural crops. Not a, a, a big impact um, uh, in terms of, of uh, crop production, perhaps, but can do a lot of damage on... Uh, in the winter time on woody plants. So <clears throat> uh, individually protecting fencing, um, taste repellents can, <clears throat> can help with that. Um, if you're gonna go fencing, you gotta make sure that you're putting a fence in a location that's not gonna be drifted over with snow. Um, and, if you're, and if you're trying to exclude them with a fence, then it's gotta be buried one inch mesh size or smaller. Um, so a little bit more difficult maybe than other animals to keep them outside the fence. Um, this is some of the damage you see from that uh, in the winter time. So there are some uh, taste repellent. Capsaicin is listed for <clears throat> as the active ingredient. Uh, it's listed for dormant use on, on fruit trees, I believe. But uh, the fungicide theorem is not. Well, make sure you check the label and the particular repellent you buy if you're going to use one of these products in the winter time. If you have some problems with damage of um, an orchard you're trying to get established, but mowing, keeping those, keeping the grass short around those trees, can benefit the tree, reduce bowl damage, and also reduce the, uh, uh, make the rabbits more susceptible to predation, and they're likely going to avoid that mowed, clean mowed area in your orchard during the winter. Uh, and then deer. So uh, the damage, because they're a large herbivore, uh, and they move around a lot. So you can see that home, that home range. This is in a, in a rural area that reduces in the winter in the uh, in an urban area, and certainly adapted to hanging out and around people. So again, examples of antler rubbing not very not tolerable on if you're trying to grow um, if you got an orchard and then deer browsing as well. So they've done some um, uh, work with making available uh, tree protectors um, for antler rubbing. This is a tree that uh, in it, it was newly planted. If we didn't uh, add um, uh, our 4-H camp facility, it's adjacent to a 1600 acre park. So large, high population of deer. If you didn't if we planted a new tree of sapling size and didn't protect it that first fall, then that was a, a, like an attractive nuisance. So they, the deer would come over and hit that tree as a visual signpost. Um, so this is just duct or a duct tape and wooden lath material. So you can buy a commercial product and put that on there. Um, and someone's mentioning soap. So orchard, there is some research that has shown, um, and depends on your situation, but a deodorant soap, um, hanging that on the tree or mixing it up in a solution and painting it on the trunk are, can be effective. Uh, if you're gonna exclude them from an area, uh, again, to make it cost effective is you're trying to protect a high value crop. So our small, uh, our, our fruit and vegetable crop areas certainly uh, fit that bill. This is, if you're gonna try to design, a, install a fence that's for deer, make sure you buy a fence charger that's designed for, uh, for deer, for wildlife but deer in particular, because they have small points of contact, their hair is hollow, um, each individual strand, so it insulates them from that charge. This is a low population design. There's aluminum foil and peanut butter tabs on that, so they, it scares them. Uh, they've gotta be able to see that kind of a fence. So this is where, uh, in this case, they've used poly tape materials. Make sure that they approach that fence at a walk. So don't put it right next to um, a fence row that, or um, 
a, a, a windbreak where they can't see that because they're just going to go on through that and take it with them. So make sure that they approach any kind of fence, but it, it, this in particular at a walk. This is another one that's a little more extensive. So you can see that space as I'm talking about that they're gonna, they can see that fence in advance. When you first put a fence up like that, you might wanna plant, might, might wanna hang plastic flagging on there, but the outside wire there, they're gonna approach from the right. Um, that's the outside of this fence. There's strawberries on the inside to the left of this photo, which they love to eat. And this has been a, a very effective design. Penn State and Kentucky both have uh, slant fence designs. All these wires are electrified. Deer want to go under or through an obstacle rather than over it. So um, this needs to be charged as soon as you electrify it, as soon as you put it up. Um, and that can be done. This is one you could install as a temporary fence design. But make sure you electrify it. Same way with this bottom fence design. See, it's only 43 inches tall. Um, the, um, uh, it's an offset fence design. This is a fence design they use at the Biltmore Estate in North Carolina. Um, and uh, the, in their use of this design, if they didn't charge up that fence the first night, if they were they've got miles of this uh, on that property, then the deer encountered it the first time without it being electrified, didn't scare them. And so they continued, some of the deer would continue to go through that after it was electrified. So um, really important concept to electrify as you build it. There's probably more research been done with deer control or management than other species. Um, this is an example where you'll see a lot of taste repellents and other repellents on the market for deer. Um, the most effective um, in, in studies is you look at what's uh, its effectiveness is this active ingredient, putrescent whole egg solids. Uh, and, that, and that is only effective for about 85% at the best. So uh, again, the Key thing down at the bottom there, the last statement, can't be used on food crops. So um, we can use it uh, in ornamental settings, but not uh, on food crops. The only food crop repellent is this last uh, ammonium soaps of fatty acids uh, as a area repellent. Um, hinder is one of the trade names. So again, area repellents are, are less effective than taste repellents. Uh, can be part of... Uh, um, an overall an integrated strategy. And there's that deodorant bar soap. There's some, uh, there's several studies done out West a number of years ago that looked at uh, deodorant soap. You can see that it doesn't protect a big area, uh, but can be effective. Um, and then predator urine, lots of these products on the market, not been shown to be effective. Some people will use propane cannons or exploders. Uh, they're for short-term removal of deer and sweet corn, especially from the deer will eat the silks, reduce um, uh, pollination. And um, so because it's short-term, uh, it's, it's okay. As soon as pollination occurs, then uh, the deer uh, will likely gradually move back in there, but the damage uh, is not going to be as as dramatic as during that important pollination. Um, anytime we're using a, a scare device, if we move it, um, and we also change the firing sequence, put it on a timer, so they can't figure it out, become accustomed to it, you're going to increase the effectiveness of that um, of that noise producing device. Um, and then, so lastly, you know, the, again, as I said in the beginning, the, uh, the, an animal has to eat, has to find a place to uh, so shelter for either to raise young or uh, to, to uh, survive. Um, and they're going to be persistent. So you've got to be uh, as uh, persistent or more to change their behavior uh, than the animal's persistence about hanging around. Use multiple strategies, right? Um, anticipate the damage. So keep a log of when this occurred last year, and then you'll be able to anticipate getting, remember, on several of these strategies, you want to implement them before damage occurs, uh, and then 
trying to catch up after damage has already really got started uh, is more difficult than uh, interceding before it really gets started. Um, a couple of resources that I mentioned, uh, Wildlife Illinois is uh, it's actually a new website um, taking over. We have still on our extension website, you'll be able to access Living with Wildlife in Illinois. Um, it was a collaborative project done with U of I Extension and Illinois Department of Natural Resources a number of years ago. Um, that website uh, will likely be uh, phased out here in the next uh, month or so and being replaced by this web website, Wildlife Illinois. Um, it's easy to remember, www.wildlifeillinois.org. That website has access to fact sheets on the species we've talked about fence design, but more importantly, who the wildlife biologist contact is or a wildlife nuisance trapper. So you can just plug in your county, find a wildlife professional, plug in your county, and then your wildlife biologist contact information pops up, as well as a list of nuisance trappers that are available for hire in your county. The Internet Center for Wildlife Damage Management has also undergone a little bit of change. Um, it is a private um, or a not-for-profit um, website now, uh, but it still contains that research-based information from our land-grant institutions that had been on the .org site. So um, if you're trying to look for Internet Center Wildlife Damage Management or ICWDM.org, it's going to not allow you to go forward. So put make sure it's .com. Um, and again, good, great resource uh, information from wildlife biologists, uh, wildlife specialists, uh, rather, at our land grant institutions across the United States. And then in Illinois, kind of a final resource you have is from the uh, USDA APHIS Wildlife Services. And I've mentioned this a couple times during this presentation. So um, they are available for both um, consultations, uh, but also in situations where um, you're having problems, especially with a protected species um, that uh, can help you develop a strategy for dealing with that, with that particular animal. And then my contact information, um, if you have questions, so. All right, well, thank you, Dave. Uh, we did have a question come in. You did a pretty good job answering most of them, um, but there was one uh, John was asking and how to keep raccoons out of his cherry trees. Um, what he has found is that they seem to like the sweet cherries yeah. about a week before they are ripe enough to pick. Um, but he's also found that it's not, it wouldn't really be cost effective to use any electrical fence around the orchard for those couple of weeks either. Okay, yeah, so <clears throat> Unfortunately, there aren't any, you know, there just aren't any uh, uh, taste or uh, area repellents. So when you're in that case, you'd need a, an area repellent, right, to keep them out of that orchard. And there's just not been anything that's shown to be effective. So uh, I think you're going to be looking at really the only alternative would long-term uh, alternative would be fencing. You could, could try um, noise or sound producing devices, but honestly, they, in my experience, they, they just are very short lived. So um, I don't know. Uh, that's a, that's a good question. If you have a, a, if you would drop me an email, I'll do some more, checking to see if there's something that something else that I'm not thinking about. Um, drop me an email and I'll, I'll follow up with that. Yeah. Teacup farm chimed in and asked if dogs would be effective for it or, or probably not. Yeah. So they, it, it's possible. They tried um, at Allerton park. They had a production garden back hmm, a number of years ago and they had a dog that inside a fence the fence the fence the garden uh, it was big a big area uh, and put a dog inside for that purpose to um and they their project failed because of the the, the um 
attitude of the dog, I guess, or if you want to look at it that way. But so you've got to have a dog that's, you know, aggressive. It's got a, mm, they, they ended up adding in other dogs. So they had two dogs in there at the same time and it increases the, uh, the, the effectiveness, but uh, there's no hard data that from that project to share with you, unfortunately, but um, other than they, uh, it was just problematic and keeping the dogs engaged with um, what they're supposed to be doing out there. Okay. Yeah. Anything else that I missed? You know, I think right. those are it. Any? Okay. Uh... All right. All right. Well, um, if you all have any additional questions for Dave, you see his email there on the screen. Otherwise, we thank you all for joining us um, for today's presentation. Um, you know, also like to thank everyone for um, you know participating today, and hope you get some information that will help you in your small farm endeavors. Hopefully, even some you can put in place yet this winter. Uh, please look for an email from us with a link to the archive webinar on the Illinois Local Foods YouTube channel, as well as a very short evaluation of the webinar you have just watched. Uh, we do look at your feedback, and we really utilize it quite a bit to shape our future webinars. We still have a couple more webinars left for the season, so please. Be sure to look for Zach Grant's email and have a good rest of your day. Yeah, there's a question about the <clears throat> stress from cannons and lights on your on your livestock, and it would be uh, obviously stressful. So you're um, uh, I think you'd have to kind of weigh uh, the impact. The, the propane cannons, I think, are um, probably better implemented in a more in a larger open range situation, but certainly would be, um, you know, disruptive to to your livestock if they're going off all night. So. Mm. They're actually they're they're working on putting collars on wolves because the wolf population out west, the wolf population increasing and causing increased damage to livestock. So they're putting these collars on wolves that uh, when they it's like an electric uh, the uh, invisible fence concept yeah. and will set off a, a sound producing device when they get close to that that fence structure um, as an experiment to see. If, uh, in an effort to you know make wolf populations uh, tolerated in in those uh, livestock production areas, so let's see how that works out. Yeah, huh. have you uh, have you done any seen anything about the the bittering agents that they put on uh, small berries? Um, it's I was reading about it with Cornell, and they had suggested almost like a grape Kool Aid type mixture mm -hmm. has to be unsweetened but for controlling birds on like blueberries raspberries and others it was mentioned yeah so there is a <clears throat> um and i haven't haven't looked at that current um uh with the use of that there's two products that you're and they're made from natural ingredients primarily grape um and it initially was used to put on grassy areas to keep geese away from homes uh, on these retention basins right and um so there's two of those products one is they have to uh one it makes them it makes them physically sick where mm -hmm. they actually are throwing up <laughs> and then one that just tastes bad so they avoid the area but uh, what they've found with geese, at least I can speak for that and maybe similar with birds is that they will eat it. It doesn't weather very well. It washes off um, pretty quickly, but the geese, uh, uh, and it's expensive, but the geese have to be retrained from time to time. So let's see oh. wherever they want to go. And I think the same thing would occur with berry production, you know. Yeah, uh, that you continue to have some damage. It might reduce the damage, but and it might be easier than. But I just don't know, Grant, about the uh, whether it's an approved product. Is it approved for 
food consumption, I assume, or? Well, you know, it was, I think it is because I was, it came from a Cornell bird okay. guide. I'll, I'll email it to you. Yeah, I email was, it and I'll, I'll do some more research on that. That's very interesting. Yeah, because I was quite surprised that there was an endorsement already. You know, I guess just to have a very, like, concrete endorsement on it, I was surprised. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, anyways. Okay. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Dave. Yep, thanks. All right. Yeah. Bye. Bye.